Following the last series of Consciously Hybrid, we're on a new journey. We're talking data. We all hear how data has value, but how do we define it? This value is not always obvious, especially in the context of public sector. We generate data from our birth to our death through many interactions with a huge number of public services. We're asking how we should be thinking about data and how it could be used in the future. So data value for me is the insights and the stories that you can tell and start to predict once you start looking at that data. So it's not, data value is not a financial value in the public sector. It's about being able to deliver better services and predict what services are going to be needed um, by UK citizens or students or, or patients. That's really data value in public sector sense. I think if you look at how things have changed in the, probably the last 15 years, the companies that are doing well today really understand about that intangible assets. So intangible assets being knowledge, um, the data, you know, the know-how, the IP and how that's all made up. And that's really changed. So I think like 15 years ago, companies would have been thinking about their physical assets, but actually the data assets are now of value. And if you think about what value means, well, the first question is to whom? Um, so you have to ask yourself that question and, and, and it, the value really varies from putting it on the balance sheet to um, understanding how you might sell it to actually how the value from opening that data up. Why, why are we thinking about data and oil in the same sentence? Well, oil is, is a liquid. So it moves, it changes form quite frequently. And that's the same as data, it's constantly moving, it's constantly changing. And if you wanna find new wells of data, it takes planning, it takes exploration. You've gotta get people to it, you've gotta find it, you've gotta build rigs, you've gotta to drill to it in most instances. And when you find it, and it's, a, it's in a different shape, a different depth, a different volume to some other data that you found somewhere else. But then of course, once you've, once you've got it out, you need to build refineries, you know, because you need to take it from this raw format into something that we can use. And that's why I like the data is the new oil analogy, because if you think about it in those terms, you start to understand about the fact that is data in its raw form valuable? Well, it is when you refine it, but then you can refine oil in to do lots of different things. So where can you use that oil? And in some ways, you'll find something that is very valuable that could give you expanded routes to market, in which case we're talking, you know, it's exponentially of value. Or it could be something that is a lubricant that makes a different part of your organisation move more freely to uh, enable it to accelerate and do more and different things. Where it breaks down in terms of oil being like data is because it's replicatable. You know, you could argue there's an infinite amount of it. So we're not talking about finite resources. We're talking the ability, if you harness it in the right kind of way, it's coming in at such a volume on a daily basis. You can, you can work out how you can build these refineries to take an almost unlimited amount of information and turn it into, in theory, an unlimited amount of value. Data value is an interesting concept. Um, in the private sector, you know, it's, it, if you think of retail, for example, uh, I think 10 years ago, we all started getting cards that we used with our shopping and we got benefits from having the card. But really what was happening there was the companies, we were giving them permission to use our shopping habits so they could market to us more effectively. There's a different type of data value that government has. Uh, government really is wanting to use, and the public sector generally, our data in order to improve the services that they can provide, understand things. And I think actually, in many ways, the public sector is only now beginning to recognize the value of that data. And it's not a monetary value, it's societal value. So one of the things we've been looking at is the value from um, sharing data. And when you share data, um, you, get, you can get more value from it. So there's some data sets that are really about being critical data infrastructure in the UK. And if you think about those, you really want those to be shared really openly. So a lot of geospatial or location data is, is in that category because it means actually there's less friction that goes on there. More people can use it and build upon it and have that added value. 
So we did some work a few years ago where we looked at data sharing across the public and private sectors. And when you look at it, if you encourage that data sharing, we, we said it could contribute between 1% and 2.5% of GDP. So then we also looked at then what that would mean if you scaled it to the top um, 20 economies in the world. And that was coming out with anything from uh, above um, $700 billion in value to the world and above. So you can see that actually there's lots of value in sharing that data. I think there's a huge opportunity for the UK, both the public sector and the private sector, to use the data that it gathers to transform their organisations. I think you can see that's happened much more so to date in the private sector. It hasn't happened so much in the public sector. And I think that, 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 that's not because the public sector doesn't want to do it. I think it, 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 it lacks the people and the, 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 the money and the time to do it. So I think that opportunity is there. I think there's a challenge for public sector because when we think about data value, people immediately think of economic value. So that really kind of puts the public sector on the back foot a little bit, I think, in terms of public expectation. And there's maybe a bit more of an education required um, to say, look, value in its broadest term can mean societal value, social value. Um, and it's, it's being able to improve services, improve the community, improve the country you live in, which has value for everybody um, in terms of you know, better quality of life, easier interaction with, with public services, the ability to plan for the future. I think the interesting part from a citizen's perspective is there needs to be more education about the value of your data. And I think that's starting to come, and we're seeing quite a lot of movement in the in the US, where there are a collection of individuals getting together and understanding that their data has value. And some people are doing it for humanitarian purposes, and some people are doing it for monetary purposes. And I think whether or not we start to see some of those models come over to the UK, which becomes around, right, okay, my data has value. So if something is freely available to me, where is the product? I'm the product. So my data has value and how can I understand whether or not it does and can I be part of that value chain, either for humanitarian purposes or for financial gain? When it comes to larger scale implementations across the public sector, you know, we are talking about less on the monetary side and more how citizens can get together and drive value across what they're doing from a citizen's perspective. And I think that comes with education of this type of data from these type of citizens would result in this type of value and what i do see as well is in terms of that education if we can get citizens to understand that there that there is more than financial benefit then they might be more willing to say well i'm actually happy to provide that information data utilization is clearly on the rise but this will likely challenge citizens understanding of data and data use. Post GDPR, the population has a new level of understanding about personal data, sometimes correctly, sometimes incorrectly. It's no surprise that the UK media find data stories a hot topic. We wondered if this could be stifling progress. After all, no department wants to be front page news because of an incorrect perception of their latest data project. The context and complexity of data use in the public sector is often misunderstood. We wanted to know how to take citizens on the journey and get those positive outcomes. My name is Rosalind Goodfellow. I'm Deputy Director for Strategy at the Geospatial Commission. Uh, the Geospatial Commission is a expert uh, data and technology policy unit that was set up in 2018 to unlock six to 11 billion pounds of value by better use of location data and technologies across the UK economy. I think the importance of bringing the public, uh, public confidence with us on the data journey that society is going on is, is very important. It's something that we in the Geospatial Commission have looked at. We ran a the first public uh, kind of dialogue, deliberative consultation um, on location data ethics. Um, in 2021. It was great to have that time where 
what we did is we got a group of uh, about 80 odd citizens together and we took them on a journey. So we didn't just ask them their view at the start. We asked them their view at the start. We then spent uh, weeks bringing experts in, bringing different views and different opinions, academics. And then through that journey, we kept asking them their views and how it was changing. When you look at how people view government and using data, we did some research a few years ago and um, you won't be surprised, but nine out of 10 people um, thought it was really important that the government used data about them ethically. You know, they, they were the up there. And it was only, um, the only organisation that they trusted more than 50% was the NHS and the healthcare, that side of things. They, they were um, more mistrusting of um, the banks and utilities, which is quite surprising actually, since we all bank and want that, that data to be right. The ones they were most distrustful of were, were social media. So only 5% of people trusted the social media companies. But there's a real interesting dynamic that's there because if you think about how freely people give their information to the social media companies without really thinking about it, but then they're, they're more suspicious of government. We, we can't go too far too fast. We have to bring people with us. Uh, and that's not just about communication and education, which is kind of telling people what you're doing. It's more about saying, you know, this, this is the project we're trying to do. This is the outcome we're trying to achieve. And with your help, like this, we can achieve it. And at the moment, the NHS, if you've got the NHS app, there's now some new features on there where you can opt in to uh, provide um, data for clinical research. And I think that's a really good example of you've put the control in the hands of the patient You've given them the visibility. You've described to them what will happen to the data, what it will be used for. There's some very obvious outcomes from that, and that person can choose whether they whether they do so or not. So I think that element of choice and control and involvement is really important to gain citizen trust. The more that citizens understand the benefits that that data can be used for, either themselves. So with location data, it's really interesting. Many people don't realize what the location data is delivering for them, even when it's you know right there on their apps. You know, getting an Uber to, to your door, you know you need to be able to put in your location for that to happen. But people don't necessarily, they just, they do it. They don't necessarily think, oh, I'm giving location data at that point. But when you explain to them that that location data is then enabling that Uber to come to where it needs to to pick them up, they're suddenly like, oh, that's really helpful. Then if you say to them, well, that data on the journeys that are happening in your area and aggregate level can then help your local council to improve the environment you live in, to improve the traffic flows, to make your road safer for your children, uh, where their walks to school and that sort of thing. People are like, oh, yeah, I want that to happen without taking them on that journey had said, you know, can the local government use your location data to, uh, you know, improve the road? People would be like, oh, no, no, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. Oh, that sounds a bit scary. So it's how do we take and, you know, part of the question that was asked was what's government's role? I actually think this is a role for the whole of society. So I think actually the, or the companies, the organisations that are taking our data, the Ubers of the world, the delivery companies, they also have that responsibility to support and educate um, uh, citizens about how that data is being used and not in the kind of thousand page terms and conditions that we all scroll down and just go, yeah, yeah, sure, but actually in an accessible way because that's the trust. We were also keen to hear examples of private sector and public sector collaborations. Could there be collaboration opportunities to advance data modernisation in the UK public sector? So, so Strava Metro is a really interesting example. Um, so they're the app that a lot of uh, open outdoor uh, activity people use to kind of move, track their movement. Um, and they have a, a thing called Strava Metro where they pull that data on an aggregate anonymised level and make it available for the public sector to use uh, to support uh, safer streets, active travel, decision making, um, and that's with the permission of the users, um, but it's also in a safe and secure way. So they would never share the data of like one person's journey. It's always a map of how people are moving in general. Tom Knights, uh, head of Strava Metro in Europe, 
And I think what Strava and Strava Metro are trying to do is educate the role of crowdsourced and kind of citizen science data. So we want to be able to work with public bodies like the Geospatial Commission to incorporate Strava Metro into studies, um, into research papers. So you can start to build a, a kind of um, model almost of, of kind of what does human powered movement look like across the UK from London all the way through to Leeds, from the outdoor um, all the way through to the kind of um, mountain um, regions in, uh, in Snowdonia. The data team um, within Transport for London were able to take the, the Strava Metro data and understand almost the traffic flow patterns that happen between say six o'clock in the morning and 10 a.m. on bike lanes. Um, I think the ambition for London is 80% of journeys cycled or walked by 2030. Um, and again, that's a national strategy that's going on. What Strava Metro is able to do is tell you potentially how big the flow of traffic going is over say Blackfriars Bridge um, or on the B network in Manchester. Um, so they can set the traffic lights um, to be particularly in favour of a, a kind of more efficient flow. Um, we can look at accident hotspots in London again to see where is their vulnerability in infrastructure that's been built um, and how can you prevent similar infrastructure projects from um, almost kind of falling into that same trap. So the opportunity to work with public sector, not just on active travel projects, but also informing um, road design, how we place make and place shape. Um, place making and place shaping is a huge uh, conversation going on at the moment. Um, and all too often, the data sets don't necessarily join up. So from Strava Metro's point of view, we've tried to make that data as accessible as possible. Um, and I think for us as a private sector company, we have to, I say, consumerize those stories to hopefully inspire the public sector agencies to, to kind of use that data set where it's going to impact the, the public realm, active travel spaces. So I think increasingly um, everyone's understanding that the, the data journey we need to take on is a collaborative one. And actually government messages come across in a certain way. And sometimes private sector organisations are uh, in a better place to present information. At this stage of our journey, we learned how the UK public sector are beginning to create, extend and modernise data-led services. This won't be without its challenges. However, with the right collaborations and expertise, we can all benefit from unlocking the potential of UK data. Next time on House of Data, we'll be asking how much data is too much data and discussing the realities of data interoperability. Thank you.